From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism. This is episode 102, and today is February 4th, 2016. Yellow, and with me is Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. And Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Dixon, oh. you're going to say hello to me today? Um, <laughs> I'm thinking about it. <laughs> I keep, you know, hearkening back to our twiv days. But so. look, Dixon, I say to you hello, and you say hello back. I do. Then Daniel says hello, and then That's you could say hello to him if you want. Well, hey, well, let's do it this way. Hello. Try it again. Try it again. Try hello. I know how to do this. <laughs> Hello. 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 He doesn't get it. Hello. Oh, I have to. Hello. Like it. Hello. 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 What's that's... that from? Three Stooges. Yeah, the Three Stooges. We just alienated our listeners. Well, maybe they uh, got a little <laughs> kick out of it. Who knows? What's the weather today, Dixon? You're looking out behind it's cloudy. me. Cloudy. It's warm. <laughs> it's a little drizzly. There's no more snow. We had three 11. feet of snow. It's eleven Celsius. Ago. It's eleven Celsius. Eleven Celsius. Snow well, pretty much gone. Cooled isn't it? down then because in the morning it was warmer than that. You know, a year ago, February, the temperature did not go above freezing. Wow. Wow. So I have a question. We haven't twipped in a while. Two weeks. And two the second of February was groundhog. Yeah. Day. So what did he see? Puxatani Phil, what did Puxatani Phil see? I don't know. What did he see? Will there be six more whatevers of I think, of this? <laughs> I, think he, I think he saw like very disturbing um, oh, things going on in <laughs> Iowa, and he just sort of wandered aimlessly about. Yeah. But that's it. right. That's right. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, this is not yeah. this week in politics. This is no. this week in that's parasitism. Right. That's right. It does have so, the P at the end. You could, does, I know. Does, I know. Does, does, you know, there probably is a This Week in Politics podcast, you know. This <laughs> week. Perhaps true. Politics. Let's see. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> there it is. Course, First hit. Of course. Um, this week in politics, CNN. Yeah. They have a page called This Week. In Oof. Politics. There's also a TV program uh, called This Week in Politics. Yeah, I no. guess it's a CNN program, but they don't use the TWIP moniker. You know, the the choices are whittling down, and um, I'm voting for Dixon de Pommier. <clears throat> hey, you know that's not a bad idea. <laughs> and your vice president. So is what, Daniel what would Griffin, happen if I right? won? I'm going to give you the same answer that Norman Mailer gave after he uh, ran for office in New York City for mm. mayor. He said, they, Mr. Mailer, what would you do if you won the election? And he said, demand a recount. <laughs> 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 and that's exactly what I would demand a recount right away because this can't be real. If Donald Trump wins, I know he's not going to win. A, he's not going to demand a you know, recount. We may have listeners who like we might. Donald. So we don't, might. You don't know alienate what? Alienate them. I'm not. We don't want to, to give them excuses to leave TWIP. This is about science. <laughs> yes. Yes. People shall we? Shall we? Science. Shall we discuss the case? Shall yeah, we remind the everyone case the case? Uh, sure, one one. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And uh, I'm reading uh, Vincent's show notes here. His show notes for me. Uh, this case involves an uncommon parasite. <laughs> I had given people that warning. A young girl, less than 10 years of age, was brought in by her parents from a rural area. She'd come to the regional hospital with fever, diarrhea for two weeks. Mm -hmm. There was no blood in the stool. Now, her parents had said that a few weeks prior to the problem, um, the whole family had gone wild (coughs) pig hunting. And uh, apparently guns were involved. Um, The young girl uh, did not consume any pig on the trip, but all the meat that she did consume... No, she did consume pig on the trip. All the meat was very well cooked. Um, She was involved in the preparation of the meat with her mother. No one else got sick. Um, As far as past stuff, no surgery, no allergies. Both parents do have diabetes. She has four brothers. There was some weight loss that the patient um, had associated with this diarrhea. Uh, This did occur outside the United States. Uh, Physical exam, she had a low-grade fever. Um, her belly was mildly um, uncomfortable. She had slight, we say microcytic or small cell anemia, so a lack of red cells and the ones that are there are a little bit small. Uh, her white count was normal, and we mentioned there were no eosinophils and uh, none, zilch. Her blood cultures were negative, and her stool examination is where we end up getting our answer. All right. 
It's funny you should say eosinophils. Oh, right. We're going to have an eosinophil paper today. We are. Now, uh, Dixon, I, yes. I don't mind if you cough for the recording, but we are in a closed room. I don't want to get your <laughs> I don't blame yet. you. No, I don't blame you. I'm not sure at what stage I am in terms of transmissibility. I don't even know what I have, but I've, I've, I'm congested. How's that? So I'm sorry, but it happens every now and then to everybody, I guess. It's a character flaw, right? It's a character Isn't that flaw. Why we get why we get sick? <laughs> Got a <laughs> missing element of my immune system, I guess, or something. We should sequence your genome. No, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Why You're not? You're going to find a lot of missing genes, I'm afraid. Yeah. Ones, Are we going to read these? The ones to do with sensibility. Uh, you know, be nice to Dixon. <laughs> Remember, nice. be nice. And, I don't know anything about. <laughs> particularly, he's he's feeling ill. <laughs> Uh, we have a bunch of guests. We have a bunch of guesses. The first one is from Peter, who said Balantidium coli infection. Right. And then Robin wrote, "Would be some organism that does not provoke the appropriate immune reaction to produce yeah. excess eosinophils and charcolidin crystals." Isospora produces both. Cryptosporidiosis produces neither. Microsporidiosis <laughs> is a veritable bag of worms. Cyclospora is acid fast and fluoresces in fluorescent microscopy and would seem to be the best gas. Well, he's doing a nice differential for us. Not bad. Isn't he? All no, right, we have great. Uh, Thank cyclospora you, and balantidium. Dixon, you want to take winks? I'd love to. Wink writes, uh, we need some new wound healing magic. I hope it comes <laughs> from Opostorcus. My wild guess for the most recent case is balantidium coli. This is because, as a protozoan, it doesn't cause eosinophilia and because pigs may be carriers. In the case of the 10-year-old helping to prepare and cook pigs, <clears throat> her drinking water may have become contaminated. Wink from Atlanta. Wink the sassy one. Do you remember that uh, commercial, Wink the sassy one? I don't. I do not. Here for someone who watches TV incessantly. I don't watch those channels. <laughs> uh, Alan writes, yep. Aloha, Doctor's Twip. It's 27 degrees C, partly cloudy with moderate VOG, that's volcanic fog, which makes the horizon blurry and high surf warnings, 35, 25 to 35-foot waves. Word. Those are those are pretty big. You know, I was thinking about. So he gives us, uh, you know, the degrees there in Celsius, and you know, if we if we count our TWIP episodes in Fahrenheit, 102 just isn't that much. But if we count them in Celsius, we've done a lot of episodes. We have done. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, pig hunting is very common here as well. Right. Of the parasites I can think of that can be caught from pigs, here's my thumbnail differential: hmm. trichinellosis. If they were not positive, they had only eaten well-cooked pork, I might suspect the diarrhea and fever were from the enteral phase of a trichinosis infection. Mm. But that seems unlikely, as the food preparation seems the suspected exposure. Balantidiasis can certainly cause diarrhea, but rarely fever. Cryptosporidiosis could cause diarrhea, possibly weight loss, and diffuse abdominal pain and fever, and the incubation period is about right. One to 12 days, seven days is typical. I've also seen patients with diarrhea and fever who are avid pig hunters who are suffering with concurrent infections of Diantamoeba fragilis and Blastocystis hominis. Right. Blastocystis hominis seems to cause diarrhea more often than we once thought, but rarely fever. Yeah. Diantamoeba fragilis can cause both diarrhea and fever by itself, and they've recently identified a cyst stage in its life cycle, although transmission still seems associated with Ascaris or Enterobius eggs. Yeah. And actually, I, I'm gonna. That's a like nice little pearl because a lot of people still teach that diantamoeba fragilis doesn't have a cyst stage, but it has been identified. So this, we our our, our listeners are keeping up on stuff. Still, these last two are rare. So I will go with a guess of cryptosporidiosis. To nail it down, oh, remember I told you it was rare. To nail it down, <laughs> one could try to find C. parvum after floating the feces in a sucrose or zinc sulfate solution. Mature oocysts are four to five microns in diameter and appear red after acid fast staining. Of course, if you're at the CDC, you can use immunofluorescence as well. If your patient is immunocompetent, then it may well be self-limiting. But I look forward to your discussion on treatment. I think... Nidazoxanide is approved, and in the past, paromamycin and azithromycin have also been used with some success. And of course, I may have totally missed something. <laughs> As always, your approachable way of teaching and making us think is appreciated. Best regards, Alan Kona Hawaii. Mm. All right, next one is from Yosef. Dear Twipzoites. That's a good one, Twipzoites. Twip. 
Hello, I'm a second year medical student, and I've been listening to your podcast since we had our microbiology course. I found listening to Twip, Twip, and Twim were great ways for me to continue to pique my interest in the subject and keep me sharp for my exams. Mm -hmm. This is the first time of responding, so I hope it goes well. The weather this past week has been truly on a roller coaster ride. With the blizzard over the weekend and the near 50 degree Fahrenheit <sighs> heat wave these past two days, I no longer know what to expect. Right now, it is cloudy and 39 degrees with 50% humidity. Well, from that, we know he's in the area. We do. For the differential, this is what I'm thinking. Primary diagnosis of Valentidium coli. Mm. It is rare for this parasite to infect people in developed countries, but it is is somewhat common in tropical areas. Mm. It is usually obtained from pig feces in unclean food or water, or hopefully in this case from an unclean pig directly. After the cysts are ingested, the cyst walls degenerate and the trophozoid invades the intestinal wall. If the infection is serious enough, then there could be ulcer formation and bleeding, which could lead to the microcytic anemia patient has diagnosis is by finding cysts or trophozoites in the stool. Other parasites, Ascaris, could cause the symptoms, but it is not that rare and should have been eliminated with proper cooking of the pig. Sarcocystis tinea trichinella, all I should have been all should have been eliminated so long as the meat was well cooked. Cryptosporidium, usually obtained from unclean water and not directly from pigs except maybe their feces. Also somewhat common, non-parasitic causes that should be kept in mind. Campylobacter, Yersinia, Enterocolitica, Salmonella, Tropical Sprue, mm -hmm. Non-Infectious, Celiac Disease, Ulcerative Colitis, Crohn's Disease. Wow, the whole spectrum. Indeed. Uh, Elise writes, Dear Twip Trifecta, how are you all? I hope this finds you well. Many apologies for missing a TWIP 100 diagnosis attempt. I was working on an educated guess and got derailed by the debris of life. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, I am pretty sure I would not have gotten the correct diagnosis. The weather here in lower Manhattan is cold and bright. 39 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, minus no, 13 degrees Celsius, but I would say appropriate for the season. This week, I'm going to hazard a guess, but I'm also sure that I won't get the right answer. The little girl in a country that is not the United States has had diarrhea and a low fever for several weeks, and all the clues indicate that she contracted a parasite after helping butcher and prepare a wild pig which she ate with her family. I understand that this is going to be a tricky diagnosis in part because this case was rather unusual and that wild pigs don't generally transmit the parasite to humans and because this is an unusual parasite. I actually went back through all of the early episodes of TWIP in hopes of being able to use our process of elimination to help me with my diagnosis, but I realized that is a lazy approach, and this time it was surely unsuccessful. The little girl's symptoms are consistent with a couple of parasitic infections. First, it resembles cryptosporidium. While pigs tend to carry it and why humans can't contract a crypto infection through blood, it is very possible that the little girl came into contact with wild pig feces matter during a fecal matter <coughs> during the butchering process. <clears throat> this doesn't seem to be an unusual enough parasite, but I would put it in the category of likely suspect. The only other parasite I've found seemed uh, like a good bet is Balantidium coli. This is another non-perfect fit for the diagnosis. The symptoms match, but again, blood contact is not necessary, and it doesn't seem to be quite unusual enough. I appreciate that these diagnoses are getting harder, and I do welcome the challenge, but I do realize it is testing my resources. Is there any? Is there some way to acquire a more recent edition of parasitic diseases? Hmm... A long pause followed. I have seen the third edition available online, but I, I know that there are more updated ones. Well, there's a fifth edition out there also someplace, so you can get one of those if you'd like. Uh, I promise to do better in the future, and many, many thanks for your excellent podcasts. Best wishes. Anne writes, Dear TWIP team, my thoughts for the diagnosis of the young girl in week 101. Mm -hmm. I am stumped. The microcytic anemia suggests iron deficiency due to blood loss. The case presentation and Daniel's hints that stool examination is diagnostic suggest that this is a primary enteric infection, and none of my differentials seem like perfect fits. I am going with Balantidium coli, a ciliate protozoan parasite. It is associated with pigs, is an uncommon parasite, does not cause eosinophilia, can cause diarrhea, dysentery, abdominal pain, and weight loss. Clinical signs are most common in the immune suppressed, according to the CDC. However, I found no discussion of fever or microcytic anemia. And though young age, 10 years, could represent immune naivete, mm -hmm. it is an immune suppression. My other considerations were 
Eternidens diminutus, a rare African and Asian helminth of non-human primates. It can cause iron deficiency anemia, per one reference, not supported in another reference. Minimal clinical signs in humans and no association with pigs. Trichurus trichura whipworm, possible association with pigs with high worm loads may see loose frequent stools. Frank blood, straining rectal prolapse is associated with blood loss and anemia, variable eosinophilia. Hookworms, ancelostoma and nicator mm-hmm. can certainly cause blood loss and variable eosinophilia. But patency period is usually 1.5 to 3 months. Of course, the pig hunting trip could be a red herring. Looking forward to the answer <laughs> rather than list every other enteric parasite I examined and dismissed. Anne Lewis, and she ha- she's a doctorate of veterinary medicine and a PhD from Beaverton, Oregon. Let me see if there are any more guesses before we go further here. You know what you should do? We should put a mute button on the uh, you know, the people would hear you coughing all How the way over here. How dare you? How dare you get a cold? <laughs> you know, Dixie, you look horrible. You should go home. <laughs> Suddenly he's a doctor. <laughs> yeah. Your eyes are bloodshot. Your face is swollen. No, it isn't. Your nose is getting longer. <laughs> your nose is getting longer. <laughs> You don't like me, do you? I love you, Vincent. I love you. <laughs> now, you say the, the picture gives it all away. Um, yeah, we I must. have to say, do you remember the dean's daughter who was very sick? Did she have balantidium? She wasn't very sick. She was chronically diarrheic. Did she have balantidium? No, no. What she, was that one? She had uh, blastocystis. Blastocystis hominis? It was the only thing they could find. Can you get that from a pig? Pause. <laughs> Can you get it from a pig? Blastocystis? I don't I don't know if it's been described. Never heard of it, but yeah. it's not out of the question. You get it from fecal contamination? Yeah, it's usually All right, so my guess is blastocystis and the pig is a red herring. That's my guess. Oh, Vincent, you're throwing a guess out there. Yeah, oh. I usually don't, but this is a tough one. So yeah. as a former laboratory technologist in the parasitology diagnostic laboratory, <laughs> why have to guess? Just look at the fecal sample and identify the stage. That's part of the, the game, Dixon. Hmm? That's part of the game. You know, and I, I know that, but that's why there is a diagnostic laboratory, because yes, otherwise in, you would... In podcasting, we give them the, all the clues but the one No, no, need. I got the premise of this. <laughs> Don't worry, but... Should we should we ask Dixon to guess? Yeah, guess, Dixon. You want to you throw a guess out, Dixon? Well, I was going to say Valentine Caller, too, but... <laughs> I got the thumbs up, by the way. <laughs> but, you know, why, again, why guess when you can know for sure? So what what, tests, what test do you want? I, know. I want a stool examination. Stool ex- okay. Yeah. What kind of a stool examination? Uh, just a regular. Just normal, just look at the stool. Just a regular stool so examination. Do a, 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 an O&P, as it's called, for ova and parasites. Yes. You get a stage of this parasite. That if it's a cyst stage, it looks very much like that old game, that first video game called Pac-Man. Uh, the cyst actually has a um, uh, a food vacuole. It's a, it's the cytostome. It's called the cytostome because it's a ciliate. By the way, this is the only ciliate. It's a holotrichous ciliate. Mm-hmm. That's the only one that infects humans. Mm. It's an amazing bug. Uh, and it can cause diarrheal disease that leads to dysentery, which would have been bloody stool, but this little girl probably hasn't had it that long for that to happen, I would say. But so now we do the stool exam. And, oh, by the way, was the stool guaiac positive? I meant to ask that. The stool was guaiac positive. Ah. Why, why do you ask about that, Dixon? Because she's got microcytic uh, anemia, and there's no frank bleeding, but nonetheless, there is some bleeding that you can detect by the guaiac test. So that would lead one to believe that there's some process going on here uh, <laughs> that could be identified through a further examination. And so that's where we're at right now. Guaiac. Guaiac. Where's that word come from? Oh. So yeah, what does that word come from? So flat. maybe we should, should we tell people what that test actually is? Yeah, please do. Now, this is something that was very commonly done, and it still is done to some degree. And you're basically taking a little bit of the stool, and um, in perfect world, it, it's allowed to dry. And then you test um, by applying a developer. And um, if there's um, hemoglobin in there, you'll actually get a change to a bluish color. 
And, you know, once a year we actually get tested, you know, can you, so has that turned blue? And you say, yes, it has. <laughs> they check you off. You're allowed to continue doing this. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, but no, I, I actually, I brought this up when I was talking to some of the medical staff this morning yep. is that um, a lot of, a lot of patients don't know if there's blood in the stool. I mean, you got to realize they're, they're sick. They're, they're, you know, they're not really doing a, an inspection or it may be that actually the amount of blood is below sort of their visual detection. Sure, that's right. Um, you know, it's watery, it's coming out. Yeah, and right. or maybe uh, so, they just ate beets and they can't tell. Well, that, that's that's true too. There there are certain diet. Yeah, no, there's actually certain dietary um, <laughs> um, sort of limitations that you, you should impose on a person if you really want to know for certain. Because certain foods you eat can actually give you a positive test, and it's not actually that there's blood. All right, it's called guaiac because the paper that you put the feces on is contains alpha guaiaconic acid, a phenolic compound extracted from the wood resin of the guayacum trees. Okay? Mm. That's why it's called a guayac. So a guayac tree paper. I like that. <laughs> guayac tree. <laughs> guayac. Could that be the title of our episode? Guayac tree <laughs> Guayac knot. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Guayac knot. Um, what does no, that but mean? <laughs> oh, why not? Guayac knot. It's sort of a play on words. Yeah, I, I got play it. Play okay. he's, oh, giving, he's giving you a hard time. Daniel. Daniel. No, but I, I want to say, I want to say to our to our listeners, our email writers, hey, this was great. I mean, we got some excellent, we um, did. some excellent differentials we did. here. We did. People sort of working through it. That's right. Um, and they did a good job of listing, you know, what are a lot of parasites yes. that can give us diarrhea and then working through and asking the question. Um, and I, I tried to make some points as I presented this about one, um, the issue of no eosinophils. And so some people correctly identified which parasitic diseases cause eosinophils, which don't. Um, and it, it is really interesting. I mean, most of these um, don't, but then there are certain ones, such as I think somebody mentioned Isospora, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, sort of going through which protozoans actually can cause um, eosinophils and which ones don't. Um, it's mostly the worms, but uh, yeah, only most, the worms. yeah, mostly the worms. So it is, it is interesting um, that and there so are a few protozoans you, that can do it as these exceptions. These shark Leiden crystals, did you get that little connection there, nope, Vincent? I was going to ask you to tell me, Dixon. I would love to tell you. Mm -hmm. So shark and Leiden were two clinicians mm -hmm. who noticed these uh, diamond-shaped, very long, thin, spindly diamond-shaped crystals, beautiful crystals in stool, uh, which were an indication of something, but they didn't know what. So eventually the connection was made between dying and, um, yeah, dying eosinophils. When they die, they release their granular contents. And some of those granules have pure proteins in them. And the protein crystallizes in the uh, feces. And that's what you're actually seeing. Got it. Um, it's indication that there's an eosinophilic process going on, mm -hmm. even though you don't see the eosinophils themselves. Particularly true in amoebic dysentery. Particular. Um, what gave it away? I don't think you said that. Not the. Well, I, I, I tried to. I tried to steer people towards because this is, as Dixon point out, this is this is one of those ones where the diagnosis was made by micro, by microscopy, yeah, and they kind of were that's like, right, well, how did right. how did this happen? Yeah, that's right. And and I tried to to tell the case in a way to make the connection that this was not something she acquired through consuming um, undercooked pork. The pork was well cooked. That it was probably something that she contracted through her exposure to the swine, right? So um, when she was just... helping mom prepare. So Daniel just got back from Peru, not just, but you, we were down yeah. there not too long ago, and uh, you were in Lima, but uh, you must have traveled throughout the country. I did go up into the mountains, yeah. You did. And you must have noticed then that uh, guinea pigs were uh, frequently offered for cuisine. <laughs> yeah, guinea pigs. I, I never quite was able to yeah, that's right. bring myself to trying. No, you're, you're quite right, but guinea pigs <laughs> are the natural host for this parasite. So when I was here as a technician working in the Department of Parasitology, we actually raised guinea pigs in order to use them for various purposes for parasitology. And indeed, a few of them tested positive for Ballantinium coli. So that was interesting. Not just the pig, but the guinea pig, which is totally unrelated to the regular pig. <laughs> I have to tell you, Dixon, when I hear Ballantidium, I think of Ballantine beer. Yeah, exactly. You're right. Exactly. Do you remember that beer? Right. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> it used to be brewed in Brooklyn, I that's, think. That's right. It was the Yankees' uh, signature drink. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Ballantine. That's a Mel Allen. Nowadays, the, uh, you don't associate alcohol with sports figures anymore, right? Um, are you kidding? <laughs> I mean, teams don't advertise alcohol, do they? Beer. I don't know. I don't watch sports. Yeah. 
No, I think some of the teams still oh, have yeah? some. Sp- I hear there's a sports theories. event coming up. Yeah, it's a little thing called Super Bowl. Yeah, I'm going to be doing other things. I'm sure. <laughs> so, hey, I'm gonna for our fa- I will be watching the Super Bowl. And, uh, I, you know what? I, as I explained again to the house staff this morning, you know, I have to do this as a clinician so that I can connect with my patients. <laughs> no, you, and, you know, and I feel bad. Right, I explained to my wife and kids. You, you know, right. I would rather spend time with you. Oh, but, but of course, I feel like you know, if I'm going to be a really good doc, I've got to watch. I've got to watch you're, the Super you're Bowl. Not wrong. You patients not will ask wrong. me about it, and then if I don't know what happened in the Super Bowl, they're not going to want to share their intimate, you know. Medical this history with with this guy. That's right. I don't you even know? know who's playing. <laughs> uh, the California, the, the Carolina Panthers uh-huh. and the Denver Broncos. Uh, care less. And I they're playing in California. <laughs> I could care less if you and Daniel were playing. No, that's. Oh, you would know that. I mean, come you know, on. Someone just died, a football player, of this terrible brain disease you get from smashing into. Kenny Stabler. He, he was the yeah. quarterback for the Oakland. What does the disease cause when you keep ramming your head? Well, they call it CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. I mean, yeah. um, we pay people to do this. this is crazy. Uh, that's right. A lot of money, too. I think everyone needs to read a good parasitology book instead of watching the Super Bowl <laughs> or else listen to a podcast. Oh, my God. You've just lost half your audience. <laughs> you don't have a lot yeah. of sports fans out there. Come on. Well, I, Come on. I bet there are some. I <laughs> Everyone can do what they want. We'll take a poll. Hey, Write us next week. You know tell what? us who you watch the Super Bowl. You know what the beauty is, Dixon? This is a free country. You can do what you want. And I can complain about what you do. <laughs> All I want. It's yeah, okay. Then, How did you treat this young girl? Now, wait yeah. a minute. You have to diagnose it first. You didn't tell me? We did We did diagnose it. I said, actually, the Ballantinium coli was seen. The trophozoite was actually. You actually saw and, a trophozoite. And uh, I have a little picture, but I won't show Dixon. Um, <laughs> really kind of this large ciliated trophozoite. In mm-hmm. fact, uh, uh-huh. on proficiency tests, when they send Ballantinium coli out as an unknown, it's frequently missed because it's so big that you pass over it, not even realizing that it's a parasite. Is that because it's, it's an unknown unknown? It's an un, it's an unknown unknown, but it's it's enormous. I mean, it's compared to the other protozoans that you'd find in stool. This is a big giant. Yeah, no, and actually, that, that's an interesting issue, right? Because I was listening to a lecture a couple weeks ago, and they were talking about how when you do um, certain types of modern AFB testing, it was a paragonimus issue. They're like, oh, and you, you never see the paragonimus. And actually, what they now realize it's because the the power is off. They're looking at they're looking on a hundred X, right? Sure, Which sure. is really down low. So you move past something like this, right. and you don't actually see the the whole um, very true. So, organism. But then you back out to a ten X. And you can actually see some of these larger parasites. Sure. Um, so that, that's sort of an issue. Um, but yeah, no, these, these things can be really big. Um, so yeah, that was actually seen. And uh, you know, the nice thing is we, we could probably go through our emails and figure out what to treat with. But in- <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. Think of all the money people could save just by uh, you know, <laughs> sending the case to us and having our emailers. Uh, so one of the um, interesting sidelights of this infection is where it's found. Mm-hmm. Okay, there's an endemic center in a place where people absolutely romanticize about one of the most beautiful places on earth and that's the Seychelles Islands off the coast of uh, yes. Africa and and this is endemic there and so a lot of people come back with this infection that went there on their honeymoons or on some exotic yeah. uh, uh, so where where was the ballantinium acquired from the pork uh, it was actually acquired from I, I'll say the the pig because it was you know not from the ingestion it was probably from the feces that was you know on the skin and the, the dressing out the carcass it. you know okay. it gets all over the place. now um, um, and and as I was going to say this person was treated with nitazoxide okay nitazoxide pronounce it I'm sure and, wrong and, and recovered um, anyway right? was treated for three days and um, you know she did great not only did she do great clinically but there were repeat stools they stayed clear. Um, so yeah. So unlike a lot of other parasites that occur in stool, uh, particularly protozoans, uh, but not all of them, this is immediately infectious. It doesn't have to go outside the body for mm-hmm. a while to mature. Mm-hmm. It's it when it's, it produces a cyst, that cyst can be transmitted right away. So and that's probably key here in the exposure, right? Yeah. So we think of a lot of things it would have to be in the soil, embryonate. We talk about, yeah, right. and then become infectious. This you could just get it or right. Spoilate from, when it gets out, like yeah. Isospora. But this thing is mm-hmm. immediately infectious. Yeah, which is probably what put her at risk. And, and I yeah. think I don't know if we have people into the esoterica, but there was always this dispute that there was two different Ballantinium, right? There was a Ballantinium suis and a Ballantinium and coli. <laughs> you know, the sort of people discussed. You know, so currently we think it's probably just the same same organism. 
Would you get it uh, from any other wild animals, Dixon? Um, Deer? Well, domestic pigs, not wild animals, but... Well, this was a wild animal. Yeah, this was a wild animal. As far as I know, I've never heard of other reservoir hosts for it, but about, maybe uh, there are. What about wild boar? There is a plethora of <laughs> listed <laughs> mammals, and <laughs> I'm sure that Daniel is going to call me out on this one. No, I, 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 did, I, was, I, I was, actually <laughs> don't remember, okay? I don't remember, because it wasn't featured mainly in our teaching program. Yeah, so non-human primates can carry it, right? I mean, that, that makes sense. Um, as guinea pigs, as Dixon mentioned, as well as wild pigs, rats. Um, we also see it in cows, horses. So there's there's a number of animals that can uh, carry these guys around in their GI tract. So maybe there are several species, just haven't been DNA typed. Maybe you know now that they're looking at you the DNA, the yeah, it, it looks like it's um, you know it, it, I always wonder like how they make these distinctions, you know, yeah. right? I mean, you know, when do you lump them and when what do you split them? Yeah, species. So. Oh, don't go there. Yeah, exactly. The ecologists <laughs> can't agree on that stuff, so don't worry about it. So yeah, so there. The, <laughs> so Ballantinium. Coli and like species, you know, are in all these different animals. So yeah, right. Okay. Um, but fortunately, it's not it's not a common infection in uh, no. in humans. So no. there, you know, as the person mentioned, there may be something special about this kid. Why they actually got so sick, right? Uh, may, you know, other people may have been exposed to this, and, and it can prove um, fatal in some cases. No, it's true, and that, that's unfortunate. You know, so a lot of people get exposed; they'll stay without symptoms. Some people just acute self-limiting, but other people develop more of an invasive disease. And if you don't treat them, those people can um, they they can die. Yeah. Um, so fortunately, this person um, didn't. They, they actually can become and they'll get a bacterial sepsis on top. Um, so yeah. Hmm. All right. All's well that ends well. I guess. And this ended well. <laughs> I guess. And, uh, in, you know, that's, look how many people got this right. They did. They did. A, is, we know, sh- we're very proud of all of you. <laughs> the, the whole class in general got an A minus. That was very good, I thought. What was the minus? I'm giving them, minus. Giving them, well, an, a, I'm giving them an A plus. There's a couple of guesses on Trichinella, and, and, and Trichinella really does have eosinophilia associated with it. Well, so you should curve it, dude. Curve it. You know, we're, we're, this, is a, this is a team effort here. They, the right thing was right there. They knew how to diagnose it, even treat it. They don't like it. Maybe they don't. don't like you. <laughs> no, I just, I think that that's dumbing stuff down. I don't do No, that. it's not. It's adjusting for the masses. So if you have a choice of taking a class taught by me or Dixon, I give more A's, apparently. Dude, if you give an exam and no one gets above a 40, are you going to fail everyone? That's called curving. You can't do no, that. No, but I, I think that the fault of that one is the teacher, not the Yeah, students. but you still have to grade them. So I took a genetics course in Cornell with Jerry Fink. And one exam, the, the top grade was a 40. No, that's ridiculous. So you have to curve it. Mm-hmm. Why would you give an exam when the top grade is only 40? It's hard. No, no, it's not hard. You have to teach the material so that you'll learn it. You can't snow them on the exam. Come on. So now, the so question. I had no, no, no. When so I taught Dixon, here at the Dixon's medical trying school, to say this my, cut off too for hard. Passing, <laughs> my cut off for passing was 70. I would not budge off of that. If they got 69, they failed. And that worked out really, really well because everybody upped their game in order to come up to 70. All right. I don't think you find many courses that are not curved these days. No, you'd be right on that. You'd be right. Do you curve your uh, ecology class? No. It's a different grading system. Though, okay. it's, we have a paper. We Again, do. suggested by Daniel, who's doing all the heavy lifting here on TWIP. <laughs> and and J- Dixon and I are just watching. But this Not is really, published in PLOS, this is an interesting paper. PLOS Pathogens. It's called Eosinophils in IL-4 Support Nematode Growth Coincident with an Innate Response to Tissue Injury. And the first author is Lu Huang, and the last author is Judith a- Appleton from Cornell. And I want to say her email is JAA2. She was the second person to get the JAA. I'm going to tell you something else. She's and a you good are, friend of mine. <laughs> so she's old because I can tell that JAA. I know her very well, by the way. Because We've been I'm VRR1 and I got I here am. in 82. And you're DDD1, right? I am. I am. How dare you be DDD1? What do you mean, how dare I? You don't deserve it. That's the way. I, yes, I do. Anyway, this is from Cornell University in Ithaca, yeah. University of Pennsylvania, and uh, the Mayo Clinic, Arizona. Is, does every state have a Mayo Clinic, by the way? No. Is a few? There's a Mayo, right, Minnesota. Minnesota. There's Rochester, a Mayo so, um, yeah. in Arizona, Scottsdale. Right. And there's a Mayo in Jackson, Florida, Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah. And they're all related? They are, actually. And they're run very similarly. It's staff, um, clinicians. And they're funded by the mayonnaise air, right? Yeah, well, they're right next to the mustard. 
Try the veal. Exactly. So Judy and I actually worked How'd together. You know her, yeah. I know her very well because we attended a lot of Trichinella meetings. Trichinella, right. Yep. It's an old relationship that goes right back to the very beginning of my career, basically. Her husband's a uh, veterinary pathologist. Hmm. I know her children. I've stayed with them. They're wonderful people. And so uh, I'm glad that she's still active. Did you get some background on this story? No. Oh, yeah. I used to didn't. teach up there, in fact, at the Baker Institute. I used to go up there and give lectures. So I'm I'm not a Cornelian. I know that's how you pronounce it. But I, I have a... What, a th- the way we pronounce it cannot be <laughs> said on air. I'll tell you later. Okay? <laughs> All right. Do it because this is a clean podcast this is a remember caleb is listening <laughs> Declan, first of all let's yes. t- have you tell us please what is a th2 immune response <laughs> <laughs> it's the opposite of a th1, TH1. of course <laughs> well it's it's an antibody mediated and it's uh, usually um, ige iga igm igg and then you've got some cells associated with them also like eosinophils and that sort of thing so it's a antibody mediated for the most part and um it's not cell mediated in that sense. You are <laughs> half correct. <laughs> not even close. No, it's the opposite of what you said. Th two is the cellular response. Th one is the antibody response. Really? Yeah. No, it's the opposite. Are you sure? Yeah, you know how I remember this. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Th two is the antibody. So, so I remember this because the first thing I ever got excited about studying was we t- do a, was uh, tuberculosis, right? And everyone loves tuberculosis, and it's inside the cell, yeah, okay, so you can't right. get it it's with antibody. antibodies. Yeah, I, I, so you should it. be nice to Dixon because he's smart. <laughs> You're not smart, actually. You're not smart. I have a good long-term <laughs> memory. How's I that? just yeah. forgot. So to keep our <laughs> list, keep our how do you keep straight? it straight? Yeah, how do you keep so, it straight? So I, I remember that. I remember TB is, I mean, you know, it, I hate to say as a parasitologist, it's one of my favorite diseases. <laughs> uh, and it's really the one where you have the TH1 response. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. And if you come at it with a secondary type of response <laughs> in TH2 with antibodies and stuff, they can't get to your TB bugs that are this inside right. the cells. Right. So the TH1 is yeah. going after stuff that's inside cells. We really yeah. need a cellular response. And the secondary stuff is for stuff that's out there, stuff that's not as important, like viruses, maybe. TH2 is, a, <laughs> is generally a viral response. TH1. Mm-hmm. TH1, actually. Because antibodies neutralize it's virus. Cells. Well, it's for actually, recovery, for recovery oh, okay. of yeah, virus fine. infection. But that's for prevention, fine. you want yeah, antibodies. Yeah. So mm-hmm. TH2 helper cells make cytokines that help yeah. B cells mature that's the one. into antibody-producing that's cells. The, one. the reason I was, I was confused is because I thought that res- resolution of a parasitic infection requires cellular immunity, no? It's all antibody-mediated? Not all. Not all. There are some... Very large parasites that are yeah. killed off by cellular responses, uh, like, for instance, schistosomes. Um, but in this case, the antibody plays a big role. But so you have to ask where the immunity actually occurs in trichinella because it's got a biphasic life cycle. The, um, that's right. Biphasic? <laughs> biphasic. It's got an <laughs> enteral phase and a parenteral phase. So enteral means it's in the gut tract uh-huh. and it's in the small intestine and it's intramulticellular. The adult worm lives in a row of columnar cells in the mm-hmm. small intestine. And then they produce uh, migrating larvae, referred to as NBLs or, or newborn larvae. And they migrate through the blood and lymph until they reach a muscle cell. And then they exit the circulation, and they penetrate the muscle cell, and they begin their intracellular life in the muscle tissue. So what's a newborn larvae? It's the, well, it's a very, very immature stage of trichinella. It's almost the same diameter as a red cell. So you get a feeling for how small these little critters are at that point. It is. It's long, but it's very narrow, and it has to be because it has to fit through the capillaries. And this is what they use to infect mice in this paper, this That's newborn right. larvae. That's You're right. familiar with that. You've made many in your lifetime. I developed the methodology for doing that, by the wow. way. I hate to brag, but that's, wow. that's my work that that's they're good. referring to. That's, Did yeah. they thank you? Did they reference your paper? Well, not that one, but they, they yeah. referenced one of them that I okay. used to, to actually work out the life cycle, the, the growth cycle in the in the muscle cells. So this paper is about trichinella spiralis. It is. Which is Dixon's thing. It's my passion. Now, they also say here, and maybe you could elaborate on this, Dixon. Sure. Eosinophilia is a hallmark of the host immune response to parasitic worms. It's true. What is eosinophilia? Well, they mean circulating eosinophilia. Okay, so the eosinophils are produced in the in the bone marrow, uh-huh. as well as the other granulocytes. And I, I think Daniel will probably talk about this better than I could, but my understanding is that there's a, there's a stem cell that gives rise to all the hemopoietic system, including the red cells and the white cells. And as the white cells mature, then there's a granulocyte colony stimulating factor, 
mm. GCSF. True. And that then divides off the uh, non-granulocytes from the granulocytes, yep. and then you've got two different kinds of granulocytes. You've got basophils and eosinophils, right? And they're definable only because of the way they take up a stain. It's yeah. a <laughs> I would say three Fs, just to clarify this. So, you yeah, so, you, so, you, so we'll, we'll separate out our, our lymphocytes, right? Move our lymphocytes yeah. out. And then you end up with your the granulocytic cells would be your neutrophils, and I'm then your sorry, eosinophils and basophils. I, I, you're yeah, absolutely right. Just I'm, to make I'm sure you get them all. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, as, as Dixon describing, you start off with a common, you know, the hematopoietic stem cell, yeah. and then you end up with the multipotent progenitor, and sure. then it divides on out to ultimately you have all these different cell types. And the eosinophils are a major player in the tissue he, helminths, Apparently the tissue so. worms. So you, you asked me once at TWIV <laughs> 200, I believe, or 300. It was at TWIV 300 in Washington. Yes, correct. What I thought was one of my um, seminal findings that right. I was very proud of. And, and what I told you was that I was able to dissect out the life cycle and expose hosts to various portions of the life mm -hmm. cycle to say which stage of the parasite actually induced the eosinophilia that we'll be talking about. Right. And the stage that induces the eosinophilia was totally unexpected. Usually you think about tissue migrating phases or close to the immune system phases mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not true at all. It turns out to be the adult parasite in the gut tract that induces the eosinophilia. Does this uh, bring back memories? Much. Oh, no. I, I, <laughs> there was a lot of this paper that I hadn't heard about before because obviously it's been brought up to date. But they went into nurse cell formation and, and, and the nutrition of the parasite and the role that IL-4 and eosinophils play mm -hmm. and STAT-6. Well, I'm spoiling the story for us. but it's okay. You're but just it, jumbling it, it up. It doesn't matter. But, <laughs> but ultimately, what they're trying to say is that the parasite – somehow manipulates the host immune system to mm -hmm. favor its m metabolism and immunosuppression at the same time. It does both of those things. And that's amazing to realize that the GLUT4 transporter, which transports lots of glucose from one mm -hmm. place to another, takes all the glucose it can out of the blood and puts it into the nerve cell so the parasite can accumulate lots of glycogen because yep. that's what it's supposed to do. Yep. And this whole paper focuses on the life of the parasite after it gets into the nurse cell. And so the life I'm, of the parasite. I am thrilled that Daniel selected this paper. Now, what they say here is, which is important background information, and you tell me, Dixon, if I'm correct. <laughs> Please, I wouldn't dare correct you. <laughs> when, Not in public. When the, <laughs> when the <laughs> newborn larvae arrive in the muscle, yeah. that is when the eosinophils are recruited, and survival, this has been previously shown, survival of that larva is dependent on IL-10 produced by eosinophils. And you're always talking about IL-10, I remember. Yeah, fact, that's... You would say it because that was the only IL you knew. <laughs> <laughs> no, I knew up to number 10. I knew <laughs> 1 through 10. <laughs> now they're up to 400 or something. So like the that. larvae need this to survive. Apparently so. Produced by eosinophils, which is supposed to be a defense mechanism. Exactly. Right? And in this paper... They find they, they find that there's another mechanism, not IL-10 median. It's, it's That's even more basic, and more right. global in terms of its effect. That sets the stage. It does for this. It does. So, and they use mice, right? They do. Did you? I used mice, rats, guinea pigs, rabbits uh, for various purposes. Yeah, I, I used a whole bunch of different kinds of animals. All right. So they also have the advantage of having various knockout mice, which you probably didn't have back then. No. And you would like to have had. I would right? love. I mean, I. You could have been a contender. I could have been a contender. <laughs> <laughs> Mitch, Mitch, I could have been. The... <laughs> First experiment they do is they take stat six knockout mice. Dixon, do you know what stat six does? Don't even go there, Vincent. Do you know what stat six does? <laughs> well, it apparently it regulates the immune response. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Stat one does one thing and stat six does another thing, but well, I'm not clear. Turns out that which... stat six is important for production of IL-4. Okay. Okay. It's a okay. signal transducer and activation of transcription. There are a bunch of stats. Do you know who discovered one of the early stat proteins? No idea. Here, Chris Schindler. You must know him. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's a doc. Right. He takes care sure. of patients. You know? Yeah. Do you know him? He's on the floor, actually. I he know. was working with Darnell. And these are proteins that are activated when your furon binds the host cell receptor. How about the stats that? are activated. They go in the nucleus and they turn on 
transcription of interferon-stimulated genes, and he discovered that one, and then they went two, three, four, five, six. Six is needed for the production of IL-4. So when they infect stat-6 knockout mice with newborn oh, larvae, oh, right. what happens? Larval growth is impaired. Yes. But they and survive. it's measured by an old technology. Tell us about it. Which I invented. <laughs> <laughs> this is your because chance. They, 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 what they, this is my chance. <laughs> no, I have blown so many chances. <laughs> but I'll tell you about this. How can this. you be so happy? It's quite, because I'm a pretty positive person, or ordinarily. Oh, he's crying now. I'm so, sorry. Yeah, I'm no, no, sorry. Swiping it's his okay, eyes. Dixon. These are tears of joy, by the way. <laughs> so in order to collect newborn larvae, what you have to do first is you have to infect orally with the stage that matures in the muscle. Okay, they're, they're referred to as muscle larvae. So you take these muscle larvae out, and how do you do that? You strip off the skin and take out the guts of the rat or mouse, and then you grind up the carcass. Mm -hmm. And then you digest it in pepsin and hydrochloric <laughs> acid for one hour. You can't do sound, it. Doesn't it sound like something Dixon would yeah, come up with? Yeah, oh, this sounds I like a Dixon idea. This. I mean, Digesting I, the whole animal. I had an industrial <laughs> meat grinder for my rats. I was, I was like the Sweeney Todd of uh, the animal kingdom here because they, they didn't like me at all. I, I felt a little guilty about what I used to do, by the way. So you take the carcass and you mince it into very small pieces that's thoroughly peppered with nurse cells and larvae mm -hmm. in them. Then you digest away the host, and this leaves the, the parasite. And the parasite is totally resistant <clears throat> to pepsin. It has to be because you swallow it and it goes down through your stomach. Got it. Right, right, right. So then That's what brilliant. do you do? Then you smart, actually. Yeah, yeah. Then you infect an animal. That's right? thinking. That's thinking. And on the fifth day, <laughs> not the fourth day, not the sixth day, but on the fifth day, because that's when mating occurs. Actually, that's not when mating occurs, but that's when the newborn larvae are starting to be produced. You then take the adults out of the gut tract, and they will come out by themselves if you mm -hmm. just slit the gut open and place it in some warm saline, the adult worms will swim out of the tissue and fall to the bottom of a, of a dish. And then you can collect them with a pipette and put them into 96 That's well cool. plates That's with cool. um, medium, and they will shed their newborn larvae. That's how they did it here. That's how they did it. Now, can I ask you another question? You can. They say they, so they orally infect these animals? Or they intravenously well, infect Intravenously. Them? Right. So they say they synchronously That's infect That's how them. they did that. That's how they do By that. By purifying the larva and just Yeah, injecting. and injecting them intravenously within, I, I would say, four hours, they're all in the muscle tissue. Okay. So STAT-6 is essential for growth, not survival. They do sit there. They don't right. die, but they don't right. grow. Right, 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 right. 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 It, would you agree with that conclusion, Daniel? I would, actually. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't sound happy, but yes. You're would. not happy? <laughs> no, I, I actually, I mean, isn't it amazing that you can actually, oh, we would like an animal that lacks stat six. Oh, I would like to order some animals that lack oh, IL-4. Yeah, oh, I would like some. Want, sure. And this is amazing. great. It's amazing. It's yeah. amazing. So they can really do these, not just in a Petri dish, but actually in real animals, basically exactly. blocking different stages exactly. of the signaling right. pathway. And knowing that oh, this stat, is great. Knowing that stat is required for IL-4, they then took IL-4 knockout mice. Right. And injected them with your newborn larvae prepared by the De Pommier method. Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> Do they, yes. they should refer yeah. to it as prepared. Well, well by the, it's yeah. it's so generalized a method now that they don't refer to it as I'm the sorry. Watson Crick model I'm really or the sorry. De Pommier method. They just do it. <laughs> I would be I would call it the De Pommier method. In I, fact, I think we should make that the title of this episode. No, the no, De no, no. Don't method. do it. Don't do it. No, that would be wrong. That would be wrong. <laughs> I yeah, will not allow like that. So anyway, when you put larvae into these mice, not easy to inject intravenously. By the way, not easy. Where do you do are it? They do it doing, to the tail vein. They, yeah, tail I was vein, thinking right? tail vein. That's not so hard, right? Ooh, you need a tuberculin syringe, and yeah. and there's a little shear forcing that goes on when you inject the newborn so they don't all live going through that syringe. I see. Shear. Yeah. Isn't but this a guy who's like injecting uh, mosquitoes and that wasn't hard, uh, but apparently... That's pretty <laughs> tough as well. I've seen that done too, but... Anyway, they, I mean, when the, the uh, growth of the larva is again impaired in IL-4 knockout yeah, mice. That's right. right? That's right. But they've used IL-13 knockout mice, uh -huh. kind of a control. Not They're fine. That's right. But I think they should have taken every IL and knocked that out and tried every one. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Now, the other thing they do is um, they, they infect bone marrow chimeric mice. Exactly. Prepared from a cross, All right, of uh, wild-type mice and the STAT-6 knockout mice. Right. And uh, only mice with the STAT6 competent bone marrow were able to support larval growth, which is more support for the idea that STAT6 is important. Yeah. You okay with that, Dixon? Very much okay. 
Yeah, I think what they're trying to get here is where's the IL-4 coming from? That's yeah. sort of where we're steering. They're trying to show that right. the IL-4 is actually coming from the, the bone marrow-derived cells. Actually, Correct. ultimately, we'll say eosinophils. Then next experiment, when, uh, when is the time during infection that eosinophils influence larval growth? And they do it at different times. They do. Not so, during the early period because there is a pause in the life cycle. And I'll mm-hmm. tell you... I'll tell you the experiment that led to that conclusion. We injected larvae intramuscularly. We didn't do it intravenously because when you do it intramuscularly, uh, it's probably less than an hour between the one that goes in first and the one that goes in last. And so you can more or less depend upon the fact that when you excise the muscle and squeeze the larvae out of that tissue, they're all basically the same. Okay, whereas if you inject them intravenously, there may be a four or five hour difference between the larvae. And that's important when you go to looking at the life cycle. So I did that every single day. I injected muscle uh, tissue for mice. Mm -hmm. And then every single day, we excised the muscle. And this was on the weekends, too, by the way. (laughs) You worked on weekends, Dixon? Oh, you betcha. Oh, lots of weekends. Many, many weekends. And so you, you do this and you excise the larvae and then you photograph them. All under the Got same it. power, and then you print them at the same magnification, mm-hmm. and then with a planimeter you can actually just go around them and get a, a what? Now they've got a device, yeah, what a was planimeter. <laughs> a planimeter. It's a little rolling device that measures the the um, length of whatever you're measuring, and if you go all the way around something, you can get the area on. Oh, is that the thing they used to measure roads? The guys walk yeah, around with absolutely. the wheel. That's a planimeter. So they have a device that they actually have. Yeah. They, updated their uh, technology they can make it much easier they they went through a lot of more manipulations to get the larvae to a stage where they could uh, photograph them and then use this device so they actually have eosinophil ablated mice they do isn't they that do cool? <laughs> isn't that cool that's so now very they, cool and if in those mice of course the the newborn larvae don't grow but if you supplement them with eosinophils that's you back. inject it that's then right. they say when in the time that you put the the larvae in does the eosinophil work? Right. And between days five and nine, it's important. But right. if you, between days 11 and 15, there's no effect on larval growth. How about? So it's got to be, you have to have the eosinophils early. What do you think about that? Well, I th- well, wait a minute. Do you have to have the eosinophils early or late? Between days five and nine. At a critical time. Five and nine. Yeah, but before that, they're not necessary. Well, they didn't look before five and nine. I thought they did. They looked between 11 and 15, and they said no only effect two on larval different, growth. Yeah, only the two time points. So they're thinking something so special about they think 5 it's to when, 9. They think it's when they arrive in the muscle, basically. Well, they, they injected them, so they should be in there in four hours. You think? I know so. I bet you would know that. Yeah, I would know that. You know, We I, did that too, but hmm. it, it didn't result in a totally synchronous infection yeah, they, because... It didn't look earlier than five and nine days, but they did say in that time period, yeah. that's where you get the eosinophil effect. Right. Right? right. Arrival in the muscle is what they say. But according to Dixon, they arrive earlier, so maybe... I don't know. Maybe they're making their way in and settling in for a while. No, there's a well. There is a delay in the growth cycle, though, because I think they have to wait for the eosinophils to become established around the mm-hmm. nerve cell in order to start their main growth cycle. <clears throat> By the way, which is a linear, thirty-seven percent increase in volume from day four until day twenty. It increases volumetrically, thirty-seven percent every single day from day four to day twenty. It's yeah. an amazing growth cycle. Got it. Amazing. Interesting also to add to this story, the worm's growth is completed at 20 days in the muscle. And you can take them out anytime after that, and they're all the same size. Now, what happens if you go back from day 20 and say, when does the worm become infectious for the next host? At 20 days for sure, because uh, we've done those experiments. Right. But what if you take them out at day 19? They're not finished with their growth cycle. Mm-hmm. Are they infectious? The answer is yes. What about 18 days? The answer is yes. Yeah. What about 17 days? The answer is yes. What about... I'm going to go down to 14. All the way down to f- how many days? I'm going to 14 days. And, still and this worm yeah. still has 37% increase of volume every day after that. Yeah. And it's got enough developmental biology under its belt, so to speak, at 14 days to complete the infection in the host. So what's this other growth all about? I think it's redundancy at that point. Dan, did you, did you pick this so that we could hear what Dixon has done? Because I didn't know all of this. 
<laughs> no, he didn't know that. Either, I was actually. I, w- I think I. I think he mentioned one time before that he had worked on Trichinella. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> no, you know. You know why I picked this? I picked it for a number of reasons. One is I felt like it was bringing a lot of stuff together. It tr- one is it it brings together this whole sort of history of Trichinella and wanting to know the mechanics of how it works. And now we've got the modern science and all the immunology behind it. Sure. And all the molecular stuff that that you get excited yeah. about, the, Vincent. There's another aspect to this that they've went on and done and that is to show the disconnection between aerobic and anaerobic metabolism in the nurse cell itself mm-hmm. later yeah Let's, yeah we'll get to that yeah we will get, we'll to, get that. to that. don't worry i'm very excited a few more about things this. here so this this eosinophil transfer okay uh into eosinophil depleted mice and it will allow the trichinella to grow right you need to have stat in those donor eosinophils. If you make the eosinophils from stat yeah. six uh, minus mice, it doesn't work. Exactly. Makes sense, right? And it didn't matter if the eosinophils were from uninfected or infected animals. Works either way. So stat six inhibits interferon gamma synthesis? I don't know about that. That's what I thought I read. They, re- they said that? Um, because I'm, I'm not interferon sure. gamma is a... It, it, do, it does, actually. Uh, it slows yeah. down the growth of trichinella. I don't know if we're there yet, though. Let's get back. Let's get there later. <laughs> okay. So right So right now, what do we know? So we know that IL-4 is critical. Yep. We know that STAT-6 is critical. critical. We know that the eosinophils are critical. We know that the IL-4 comes from the eosinophils. Right. And the, we know that the immune response to infection is not necessary for conditioning the eosinophil. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So exactly. Th- that's the, they can just show up and it's all good. Exactly. And eosinophil, a naive eosinophil is fine. Right. And they have to be IL-4 positive, right? We got, that's what we know so far. Mm-hmm. All right. The next bunch of experiments actually deals with adaptive immunity. Right. And they do the experiments in rag knockout mice. Yeah. Do you know about those? Well, I don't mean of, to put you on the spot, <laughs> but I know you like to explain I'm things. always on the spot. It doesn't really matter. But, uh, we've talked about RAG and, and TWIV a lot. RAG is recombination activation gene, which is responsible for the production of the adaptive immune response, sure. right? So if you take out the RAG gene, you don't get B cells for sure. True. Do you get T cells? No, it interferes with T cells. But the, well. main, the main deficit, I'll say. Because they basically about, try to knock out the adaptive. So yeah, right. T and B. You still have natural killer cells, though, I presume. Hmm. What, what is the effect of RAG knockouts on NK cells? Um, Let's look this it is up interesting. Let's look I should know this. This is <laughs> RAG I just knockout. thought of something. No, actually, that's, that's an important. Because I, I sort of think of them as like an orphan relative of the T cells. It's the last resort. In right, they, have no, <laughs> they have no mature B or T cells, for sure. True. None. Uh, uh, let's look about NK cells. Uh, NK That's cells. Interesting. Uh, let's see. Huh. NK. They don't mention NK in the uh, in the article about no. it. So I you think know, they're we, okay. We do, we do ignore them in general. So. <laughs> <laughs> Poor neglected little NK cells. It, oh, turns, it turns out, Dixon, that um, RAG doesn't matter. Good. The larvae grow fine in rag knockout mice. Okay? okay? So you don't need to have any kind of a immune response. No. Okay, you okay with that? Well, they did a eosinophil experiment here, too. Let me see if I can find it. Eosinophil, okay. So in rag minus mice. you got to get near the, the mic. Dixon. I was going to sneeze. That's why I went over here. No, I'm not going to sneeze now. Oh, wait. We'll wait for you. I'm fine. I'm sorry that I'm exhibiting signs and symptoms. Yes, and now we've, we've taken symptoms. it that one step further. This is about innate immunity. This does yes. not have to do with T and B cells. Those are not right. of consequence here. That's right. Oh, so they, they now take RAG2 knockout gamma chain, common gamma chain knockout mice, which do not make innate lymphoid cells. And they ask if the larvae will grow in them. And and they uh, will grow and their, their growth is stimulated by eosinophils. There you go. And they need to be... Uh, IL-4 positive eosinophils. Right. Conclusion is eosinophils regulate larval growth uh, independent of innate lymphoid cells. Uh, Daniel, once a long time ago, you explained innate lymphoid cells to us. Mm -hmm. Tell us briefly what what these are. All right. <laughs> in, a, in a nutshell for the listeners, you, sort of, you, can, you can remove most, I'm going to say most of your T and B cells, but I'm going to leave a few a few left. You have those B1 cells we once talked about, mm. sort of this mm-hmm. innate um, type of B cell. You might have um, the gamma delta um, T cells and maybe some innate T cells, but then you're left with basophils, eosinophils, neutrophils. And the idea is these are sort of ready to go right off the bat. They don't have to do any germ cell, germinal center maturation or anything. Um, and what they're doing here is they're really restricting it down. So among the innate cells, the ones that we only really seem to care much about is the, are the eosinophils. 
Okay. Now, Dixon, the next series yes. of experiments involves transcriptional analysis. Yeah. You take RNA from cells and you sequence it all, and you then you do oh. bioinformatics and you say what what gene what genes their expression is changing at one hundred one thousand five hundred and some odd differences. And when, and this is um, when um, and, what did they sequence and here? They looked, looked at clusters. Um, muscle of infected mice. Yeah, they're looking at myogenic program disruptors. They didn't look at myo so D looking, or anything like they're that. They're taking but, the muscle yeah, and asking yeah. how, what's going on. That's right. Um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if they put uh, larvae in these or if they just put eosinophils in. Eosinophil-mediated larval growth. Yes. Okay. Yes. They find four clusters of genes whose expression is altered. Exactly. First is involved in muscle organ development yep. and acetyl-CoA metabolism. Right. Energy. Uh, the second is genes involved in defenses. Yep. Uh, another is uh, remodeling and wound healing. Remodeling and Cellular wound. remodeling and wound healing. Yeah. And another is antigen presentation and immune activation. That's uh, immune responses, right. right? And the last is interferon signaling. Right. Now, um, collagen formation, muscle repair. So all these things are happening because of the larvae in there. It's you messing with you. the muscle, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Muscle cell. Uh, we, okay. <laughs> We've so heard about college, this before. Collagen is, is mucked up, I it's guess. Big deal. Yeah, we see not, alterations in it's collagen. It's not mucked up. It's overexpressed. What they've got is an overexpression of well, collagen oh, type collagen 4. Collagen capsule, right? You bet. And then you have cross-linking collagens that hold the fours together. Yeah, so they see an upregulation of genes involved in collagen so formation. Makes we did sense. studies on this back in the old days, doing both northerns and uh, antibody studies uh, using... Um, you know, mice as our model, of course, to show that the uh, collagen type 4 genes are upregulated until the worm achieves maturity at about 30 days. And then it shuts off. But the collagen mm -hmm. type 6, which was also upregulated, remains on. So what's going on there? And we speculated that since collagen type 6 is the bridge collagen between two larger strands of collagen type 4 right. and cells are constantly going in and out of the nurse cell the only way to do that is to disrupt the collagen 6 links so the cell has to have a way of repairing them again right so that's why the upregulation okay. of 6 looks so good why is muscle repair why are muscle repair genes going up is the larva damaging the muscle? The larva is not just damaging the muscle. Seeding it's changing it? the entire myogenic program. Myogenic. It's it's totally different. I mean, it's it goes from an aerobic to an anaerobic. Mm. goes from a low glycogen to a high glycogen content. The mitochondria are all screwed up in the muscle cell, um, in the portion of muscle cell that harbors the worm, not the rest of it, of course. Because the parasite's job is to keep that host alive for as long as possible so that it moves away from the site of infection. It can, <clears throat> you know, live three more years if it's a pig or something like this. And there where it dies, it's, 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 it's distributed, the parasite, among the wildlife. All right, the next uh, set of experiments are to address this observation made in, in this transcriptome analysis that the expression of genes involved in acetyl-CoA metabolism yeah. go down. And what would that mean, Dixon? Uh, well, and I guess it means that the TCA cycle is inhibited. Yeah, exactly, which is an energy-generating cycle. Yeah, but it's aerobic. It's aerobic. So the aerobic cycles yeah. are down. The anaerobic cycles so are up. So if you're, if, you're if you're moving down a TCA cycle, yeah. how could you compensate for that? Uh, you could probably go into glycogen metabolism, and lots of glucose, alternate pathways, so, pentose shunt, all this stuff. And that's what they found. <coughs> so they find an increase in AKT, which is a transcription factor involved in glucose, turning on glucose metabolic and genes, and they and GLUT4, glut, glut which is a transporter, transporter. right? Transporter. It's upregulated. In the muscle, they, right? Yeah, they overexpress, and uh, they've got a lot of excess of, of glucose to, to bring into that cell. So why, why does the trichinella cause this shift to glucose metabolism or away from Because it's an anaerobe. It, it's going into anaerobic? It is an anaerobe. It, the, the parasite the is, an is an anaerobe, anaerobe when right, it lives right. in the muscle. So... What it's making the muscle shift to anaerobic because if it doesn't, it's not going to get enough it make, to eat. Doesn't it make your muscles hurt? Well, this is in your gut. You don't have any pain oh, receptors. What do you mean in your gut? It's all over. It's no, all it's in, in your, your striated skeletal muscles. So everywhere. don't you feel pain? There's a temporary inflammation associated with the infection, and that's the clinical but aspect. This, this, wouldn't this anaerobic metabolism 
hurt pain? pain? No. Would, would it hurt you? <laughs> would it be pain? I, you know what I'm you thinking know, of? Really, you mean because oxygen, the lactic acid I'm thinking, produced at the end? I'm th- yes, when exactly. You, like when you yes. go out for a long well, run worm, and you get all, yeah, you get you, all that. Do you yeah. know what byproducts this worm makes? It's, uh, it's actually they? more lipid. Yeah. Than it is glycogen degradation because it uses all the glycogen to transform from a muscle larva to an adult. It does that in 36 hours. It needs a tremendous energy reserve in order to do that in such a short period of time. So instead of burning its glycogen, it stores it. And what does it do instead? It burns lipid and it produces some weird envelaric acid is one of them and there are mm. a couple of others too so uh it's got a strange metabolism to be honest so, so dixon does does trick heavy trichinella infection affect your performance your athletic performance <laughs> that's a great <laughs> question <laughs> they've actually done um physical studies on animals with and without trichinella and the answer is no uh, ultimately, there's no difference that, that between a heavily infected animal that's recovered fully and an animal that's never seen trichinella before. I can see this is a new way of carb loading, right? Yeah, that's what I'm, yeah I'm trying to figure out. Am I going yeah, to win the Tour de France if I can just get infected with enough <laughs> Yes, you are, Lance. <laughs> um, this worm has great need for hurrying up once it's swallowed. That's all I can tell mm. you. And so this is the, its emergency energy package. And it's eating all this sugar. Is that healthy? I thought it wasn't so healthy to eat all this sugar. <laughs> well, they've got type 3 diabetes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Last experiment shows basically that um, uh, they have – what are these phil mice? Are these the uh, the uh, eosinophil ablated mice? Phil, P-H-I-L, do you remember? I forgot. Let's see here. I th- Think received lots of mouse I think grains. They are. Let me just check. Phil, Phil uh, you know, Phil. but I did while you guys were chatting there. Yes, I looked Phil. up the rag yeah. effect on NK cells, and actually, you end up with normal numbers. It looks like, but there's some question in the literature about whether the function of the NK cells is still uh, preserved. Can they home? Uh, yeah. So, all right, Phil cells are eosinophil ablated. All right. Okay. So they take those and they infect them, and they do transcriptional analysis, and they show that. Phil mice, <laughs> Phil, hey Phil, <laughs> they show ex- sustained activation of interferon signaling genes and STAT1 compared to wild type mice. So basically, um, when you put these, these larvae in, it induces a local inflammation controlled by eosinophils with an altered nutrient metabolism, which we just discussed, Yeah, and uh, inflammation caused by interferon signaling. It's remarkable. I mean, they've done a lot of work, and it's it's there to be congratulated. This lady is your contemporary, right? She is. And she's still going strong. She is. Like the Mallory battery or whatever. You know, like the, <laughs> that little rabbit. <laughs> well, isn't it, Dixon still goes, he's just shifted. Now he's really focused on this uh, edutainment um, field. Oh, edutainment. No, but, it is, but I think as, as we were starting to talk about <coughs> this is this is pretty impressive stuff. So we're seeing that somehow what the worm has done is co-opted our immune response. Yeah, we, sure. we send in the eosinophils and they're like, oh, this is great. This is like one of those, those shows, you know, where like, okay, now is when the FBI is going to cut the power <laughs> and they need them to cut the power to get into this safe and so that's what they're doing they they know our plan they know our our playbook and they're like okay here come the eosinophils they'll be here about day five perfect timing now we're going to make our nurse cells let's shut down that that type one you know we're going to actually inhibit interferon gamma and the type one because we want this nice eosinophil response Um, it's it's impressive so i have um a a, que- a generic question that I've always wondered the answer to, of course. Uh, if you, in the old days, I mean, what I'm saying the old days, back in the day, as it were, uh, 70s, 80s, 90s, even, uh, Jackson Laboratories and Bar Harbor had tons of inbred strains of mice that you could order for mm-hmm. purposes, but we didn't really understand fully why they were behaving the way they did. C3 HEJ mice, for instance, were totally uh, susceptible to this infection, whereas DBA2 mice were hardly susceptible to this infection, yeah. as measured by the number of larvae that they would accumulate in their muscle yeah. tissue. I'm wondering now, if you went back into those strains and measured the things that we've learned about in this paper, that you could line them up according to their STAT1 versus STAT6 responses, their eosinophil responses, and whether or not they could knock off those larvae in the muscle or not. Or whether they could survive mm-hmm. because they were lacking in certain uh, elements needed for their completion. Well, now we cycle. we also can target uh, genetic alterations in sure. mice, which you couldn't do before. So, but it would be lovely specific. to see this list of yeah. susceptible strains of mice and non-susceptible yep. explained. Yeah, sequence their genomes. 
Uh, maybe Not that's been hard. done. I mean, it, it might have been done. Not too hard. Uh, Daniel, when an eosinophil comes to an infected area, uh, yes. let's say the, the larvae of the trichinella, how would it get rid of it? What would be the uh, approach? Well, so there, so as, as Dixon mentioned, these are granulocytes, right? So mm. they actually have these um, vacuoles full of... Um, proteins that have proteolytic activity, okay. destructive activity. And they'll often actually degranulate. They'll release these contents yeah, yeah. onto the surface of the parasite and destroy them. So why does trichinella uh, resist that? Well, I'm not or sure how? these cells are degranulating around the nurse cell. Okay. I'm not really sure they're doing are they, that. Are the nurse cells inhibiting the degranulation, do you Perhaps. think? Or maybe they're not stimulated to, to act in an immune fashion, rather just to release the so, cytokine I mean, that induces IL-4. That is in itself an interesting question. It's very interesting. So the worm probably has a way of controlling them right, too right. because they secrete things into this environment that have lots of bioactive materials. So it would be fascinating to find out you know, which of the five different types of stickocyte granules the worm has access to. There, there's the weaponry right, of the worm. Right, right. Which one would target the degranulation of the eosinophils? Because there is a protein called major basic protein that's produced by the eosinophil, which is extremely toxic to parasites. In fact, it, it burns holes in them, basically, just physically. And, and it's been shown that eosinophils plus IgM and IgE in, not in combination, but either or, mm -hmm. with uh, schistosomula in vitro, <laughs> they'll get killed. They'll just all get killed. So that's the mechanism for preventing infection in the skin. Mm -hmm. Then that's why people living in an endemic area accumulate their infections over the first, let's say, 15 years of their life. And then after that, they don't accumulate any more worms. Mm -hmm. They can intercept all of them in their skin using this mechanism of uh, killing. But when trichinella, it's a totally different story. I and mean, this is really interesting. How do you get the eosinophil to do only what you want? Exactly. But basically not to bite the that's hand right. of the trainer. You that's right. got it. Yeah, so so that's, that's, these are interesting it. questions. What we know from this paper is that the, the trichinella would like to have IL-4 produced by eosinophils. Right. And their thinking is that this enhances their uptake of glucose in, into the worm, right? And these guys, their, their, their proposal is um, the IL-4 is actually limiting... STAT1 signaling, which would inhibit glucose and lipid metabolism. So that's no longer inhibited, so the worm can, can do that, can Got do it. glucose metabolism. Got so it. that's pretty cool. Yeah. But uh, all these other effects are really interesting to sort out. And Dixon, you used to say, nobody works on trichinella anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Hardly but, anybody does. I mean, the Chinese are still doing a lot of work on it, and apparently Judy has maintained her presence in that field. And I'm How many glad that labs she is. in the U.S. are working on trichinella? Isn't this well, you know, look uh, them up on NIH grants, and it, it, uh, I don't know of, of anybody else except this group that's right now very active in it. There's a couple of groups in England. There's some in France and Spain and um, in Thailand. There's a, there's, there's a fair number around the world. Japan has a few groups. It used to be more. Well, you know, I search for trichinella on uh, PubMed, yeah. and I get 2016 papers yeah, yeah. having to do with uh, anti-parasitic drugs, yep. mouse models, immunodominant epitopes, See that? Um, how to get rid of them in a slaughterhouse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> a lot of epidemiology, a lot of outbreak reports and that sort of thing. In larval invasion and survival in mice, ooh, in the relationship to double-stranded RNA-mediated silencing, uh, uh, muscle uptake of infection. Dixon, and a lot of these are from China. Yeah. You're right. We're from China. Trichinella zimbabwensis. That's new also, but um, I think there's a brand new species also. Yeah, they've increased the number of, uh, of species. Yeah. Dixon, I are think... Are they 11 or something? We, was yeah, it, something was like listen, that. could you do the following for our next episode? Sure. Make a literature <laughs> search and, and report to us what's being done. <laughs> yeah, he's laughing. He never no, no, I... I, I am an orange goer for this. I mean, I go into the literature every now and then just to see what's new. I keep looking briefly, for... Though, right? Just briefly, yeah. I'm right. actually revising. I will probably be revising the trichinella chapter. <laughs> no, no, don't do that. I will, I'll do that. <laughs> you want you think that? So? You think <laughs> no, I think I do want that. But <laughs> what I'm hoping for is someone comes up with an explanation as to what all these stickocyte granules do for stick the sites. parasite. Stick yeah. Sites. yeah. But it does make me wonder clinically. You know, we think, okay, the person's got trichinella here. You know, and it's early, and oh, they got all these symptoms. Right. And, you know, what are we going to do? And we always say it's kind of too late. We'll ride it out. And then we think, well, maybe we'll do prednisone just to ease their symptoms. But maybe yeah. if we give them prednisone, 
which gets rid of the eosinophils, <laughs> maybe we're actually going to interfere with trichinella's ability to form all the nerve cells. It gets rid of eosinophils? Yeah. 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 When you give someone steroids, and, and this wow. was this came up with a case this morning. When would you um, give it? When the, once the guys are in the muscle, it's we not going right to help. between five and nine. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, so every it's, time you eat meat, you take some prednisone. That's what just, <laughs> just in case. Ooh. Just in case. <laughs> not good for other things, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, people who take steroids have other problems. They have right? lots well, of Well, you know, problems. you get the case where you find out like I think we had that case, maybe I'll present it again, but where the guy up in Alaska has the uh, mm. wild bear meat, yeah, right? Yeah. And then he gets sick. Mm. And then, um, you know, you find out the wife just, just ate some five <laughs> days ago. <laughs> yeah. Do you go ahead and you say, you know what, let's put you on a week of steroids so that those guys can't, you know, who knows? So you could use this mouse model to assess the impact of, of steroid treatment. And you could do yeah, that. You, yeah, could, you could take the mice, that. you could expose them. Dixon, I think you ought to write a grant proposal to do this. You're not interested? A, I don't have a laboratory. You can use my lab. You can, you can hang out with me. <laughs> you guys, you're putting a lot of pressure on me here. <laughs> you, you're finished, right? I don't think I'm going to get back in the lab. That's uh, right. I think I'm done. All right. Let's do another case, Daniel. Okay. I guess you have one, right? I, I got one right here. <laughs> It's, this is a good case. You know, I, I saw a case this morning, and I was so tempted to like just. <laughs> why don't I present that one? But uh, I'll I'll save that for another day. Okay, is everyone ready? Here I'm we ready. go. Ready. I'm gonna type. Um, we have a 24 year, 27 year old. No, 24. <laughs> <laughs> Make up your mind. Okay. It says 24 on the papers. I'll go with that. Okay. 24, 24 year old housewife from a village outside of Calcutta. And she comes into a tertiary care hospital with a report of six months of coughing up blood. She reports fever, but no weight loss. She reports that she drinks rainwater. She milks her cow. Um, She's not near the coast. Um, So Calcutta, but inland, right? Right. Um, And she reports that although there are dogs everywhere, there is no livestock other than the cows. Huh. She drinks rainwater, and that's it. She doesn't drink. She doesn't eat anything else. <laughs> <laughs> no, she, what does she, she, eat? she eats a normal. We'll say a normal. Does she diet. eat meat? Yeah, she eats meat. Is it well cooked? Um, she says it is. Is she married? She is married. Twenty four years old, mm-hmm. and um, um, does, does she have affairs with other people? Sexually transmitted things. She she does not report any extramarital sexual encounters. Okay. And uh, how's her husband? He is well. No kids? Uh, she does. She has four children. Wow. Four children. And how are they? At the age of 24. <laughs> That's yes. a burden. That's a lot of work. Yes. <clears throat> two boys, two girls, and they are healthy. Um, what does her husband do? Dix, Dixon's coughing on me there. I'm very um, I don't know, actually. I don't know what her husband does. So she, why does she drink rainwater, by the way? Why can't she buy, like, uh, she Poland is, Spring? Um, she's, she's not, not um, very well. Not doing well economically. Economically? Okay. Yeah. Um, but she eats- Which is interesting, though, like, because a lot of places, right, as we know, have these wells, right? Everyone goes to the well and pumps. But apparently she's getting the, the rainwater sort of runoff thing. So that's so sort she, of interesting. So how does it collect it from her roof yeah. into, a, into a bucket or something? Well, they call them cisterns. So cistern, there's a collection yeah, yeah. from the roof, and then it fills a, uh, is the a cistern, container. Is the cistern covered? The cistern is covered. And that's actually pretty key, right? Because otherwise, otherwise stuff gets in the cistern. Well, in, in certain places, the bats, when they drain palm sap oil from the tree, if you don't cover it, the bats poop in it at night, and then you get neep. Nipo virus infection. <laughs> so the, this is the true. key and pee, but it tastes so good. The key was to cover the <laughs> the, the key was to cover the collection vessels yeah. that are stuck Not on the side of the palm <laughs> date palm trees. Yeah, very low tech. So now it's okay to drink the date palm stuff. I can as go. long as you keep it when covered I'm over so there the bats, this summer, so the bats can't get in. Yeah. Okay, but uh, you know if someone gives it to you in a jar, you don't know where. It came yeah, from, you don't know so where. It. I would be very careful. Um, all right. Any other health issues we should know about? Yes. Yeah, so she doesn't report any problems. No past medical history. She's had no prior surgery. She not. She's not on any medication. She's not allergic to any anything that she reports. Does she feel tired? Um, she, she doesn't feel well. But but you know not not particularly bad. She has reasonable energy. No weight loss. Right. And there are no pains anywhere. No. It's just this cough. Coughing. Uh, she's she coughing all the time, like Dixon has been, and. 
each time gives up blood or once a week? No blood from Dick. So, uh, not yet. <laughs> so no, no, actually, and I think that's important. Um, you know, cause w- when I initially, you know, was, saw this woman, um, I did ask a little bit more about, can you describe this? You know, you, you say you coughed up, well, I coughed up blood, but normally it's kind of clear, clear the stuff that she's coughing up. Mm. Um, and I'm going to say this is a hint. She she describes it as like a salty, coughing up like a salty, clear mucus. Okay. I specifically asked her. She has no no blood <laughs> in her stool, does she? No blood in the stool. Mm. And she's not been anywhere else, right? She's just, just been, been living outside that village. But boy, after six months of uh, continuing to cough and not. You know, not feeling like she's getting better, she came to this tertiary hospital. And the stool is normal. Um, I don't think we're there yet. We haven't haven't examined (laughs) her yet. Has she noticed anything? (laughs) Oh, oh, has she noticed anything? Uh, She has not noticed any changes in her stool. Okay. Anything else for you, Dixon? Um, no overt signs of anemia just by looking. No. No, she she has no overt signs of anemia. I have a Normal wonder. Way. I have a wonderful picture of her, Do you? which I'm going to fold just so you don't get anything else other than. She actually looks pretty healthy, right? She looks pretty good. Just goes to show you looks are deceiving. <laughs> All right, so um, are you going to give us any uh, uh, other laboratory observations? Well, let's do the exam, right? We'll get yeah. people back into the gist right. of things. So we, we look at her and we examine her, and actually she looks pretty good. She doesn't appear to be notably ill. Um, listen to her lungs, her heart, check her abdomen, you know, liver, spleen, her normal size, lungs are clear, her heart sounds fine, abdomen's soft, it's her belly. Um, and uh, and then we go ahead and we're going to maybe we're going to get some lab tests. Mm-hmm. So we do we do some labs and I'm going to tell you that what is um, interesting is she has a white count of 9000. Mm-hmm. Okay? With 12% eosinophils. <laughs> nice. So we're going to we're going to give you a total eosinophil count, which I always tell people, right? We don't want to just know the percentage, we want to know what does that add up to. So 12% of 9000, can anyone do the math? 10 percent would be 900 yeah, yeah. so a little bit more than about a thousand yes it's got a yes of about a thousand um so, what's a, what's so that's normal, actually what's a normal use less than 500 right, yeah all right so it's elevated so it is. yeah so she's got ele- so she's got eosinophilia oh my gosh we just talked about eosinophils. <laughs> we did we did we did <laughs> so she has elevated eosinophil so it could be trichodella <laughs> if we only were looking at it in a vacuum. So she's got elevated eosinophils. And um, I'm going to give you two other bits of data, which I think are going to be helpful here, right? She's coughing. Mm-hmm. And so we do a chest X-ray yep. as well as a chest CT. Good. This is all I'm going to give you guys, and then you're going to be on your own. And I'm using guys in the generic, you know, men, women, uh, everybody listening. Yeah, it's okay. I want to be politically yeah, correct. To the mic, Dick. You have to um, talk into the mic. I'm not ready to talk yet. <laughs> so she she does have a lesion we see on her chest X-ray. It's on the left side. Um, and when we do the CT, it shows a four centimeter cavity with an air pocket on the left side. So we have a four centimeter cavity with an air pocket on the left side, Very um, mid lung. You got a picture there, huh? and that's all you get. That's enough. Can I see that? Is that you, can, you get to see the pictures because you're all there by him? But so oh, what do we want to nice, know? So we want nice lady. We want to hit people with the same thing. Um, Eating habits. So we want to <laughs> know. Um, I love her shawl. It's beautiful. Yes. Yes. It's very nice. You know what the best part of clinical medicine is? People. The the people. Yeah, of course, except the people. Dixon. <laughs> yes. Oof. Oof. <laughs> Bleeding from the side. But um, so, tell me again where so she's gonna, from. She's from Calcutta, Calcutta. village right. inland from Calcutta. Right. Okay. And uh, what we want people to do is come up with a differential. What are the list of possibilities? Right. And what would be the what would be the next uh, what would be the test you do? How would you how would you sort out what's wrong with this? So let's go through and okay. And did you want to ask a couple quick questions before we? No, I think I've got enough information here. I have um, a feeling that I, I can wait, almost... So, so um, you know, you asked a bit about diet, and I, I gave you what we knew. Right. Got it. Right. Did nothing, you ask her if she... special or exciting that she told us? special or exciting. Now, she, she doesn't have AIDS, right? No. 
That's an excellent. No, that's an excellent question. But she doesn't. And have and uh, is it, so she her. And I will say she's she's not infected with the HIV virus. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean it's such a huge problem in so many parts of the world. Even here in the U.S., you know, I like to point out that when I, I get a case, I always want to know: is this person immunocompromised? Are they HIV negative? And we say we're supposed to be screening everybody for HIV because it's you know we got over a million people infected in the U.S. Did you do um, a TB test? And so she's HIV negative. Um, so you want you you know we'll put this on our list. You want a TB test? Yeah, I'd like to die. What you, kind of what kind of TB test do you want? Uh, let's see, tuberculin. So you want a skin test for TB? I think so. Okay. Do you want to sputum? Uh, well, I'm getting to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Does she have any pets? Uh, what, what did she say about animals? She said there are dogs everywhere. That's it. Dogs. dogs? Are there birds around? Everywhere. Um, there's some birds, but not that she keeps, not as pets. Outside there are birds, right? Mm-hmm. Dogs. And is, the, is the soil dusty? Um, actually, it is, yes. Mm, birds. Okay. So was, okay. along with the uh, acid fast test. Okay, so you do, want you want some sputum here. I do. You want some uh, stool. Uh, TB. You want some stool. Uh, okay, but, but we don't do TB on TWIP, do we? Just want to rule it out. I would like to rule it out. I certainly would. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, right. I think six months we, of uh, I think hemoptysis <laughs> in uh, right. in India is TB till proven otherwise, right? With, with, with a cavitary, with a cavitary, yeah, you know, yeah, that's that would right. be that's, the first thing. You know, and when I see this woman, right, I don't, I don't know, I'm going to be talking about her on Twip. Right. <laughs> right. right. You saw her in India. Yes. Mm. Well. Right. Okay, I'm good. Yeah, I could use some more information about eating habits, but I don't think you're going to get them. Okay. So. We don't know anymore, unfortunately. We don't know anymore. We got what we got. All right. Um, anything else before we move on? We're almost finished here. We have a couple of emails. Yeah. Would you like to go through them, gentlemen? First one is from Witama, which is a very nice name. Witama. I like that name. I want to change my name to Witama. <laughs> <laughs> dear, dear, dear Twip hosts, in Twip 100, you spoke about the loss of transgenes from mosquitoes due to natural mutation. Would this idea work to keep Cas9 from mutating? Incorporate a selective pressure lethal gene that the CRISPR system disrupts. This way, the mozzies have to keep the Cas gene or the selective mozzies. pressure gene will reduce their fitness. Right. Um, great to see you reach the 100 mark. Hopefully, many more to come. Okay, so that's a good idea. You put a gene in that would kill the mosquitoes, the mozzies, unless, um, so, and, and CRISPR is disrupting it. And if you if you mutate Cas9, it's no longer disruptive, so it would be lethal. Uh, it's a good idea, but I have a feeling the gene would just mutate because there's no reason to have it there, this lethal gene. And so then Cas would go away and it wouldn't matter because the gene would be mutated, right? Because it's going to accumulate mutations. Yeah, I mean, that's the no- challenge is we, we, things sort of naturally mutate <laughs> unless there's a pressure to maintain it. So what would be the pressure to maintain a lethal gene? That's a lot of the concern. I think, you know, we talk about, oh, we'll just put a kill in there. And people always say that. What's the pressure to keep a yeah, kill switch right. gene? Well, you've just said it, haven't you? What if you put another gene also connected to the Casper, which has nothing to do with its mode of action, but which gives the mosquito an advantage, like it's a more efficient use of glucose or something like that. Well, no, that's uh, no, that's super mosquitoes. Look, there. That's, well, <laughs> that would be good. Now, I don't know mosquito biology enough to know if such genes have been identified, but that could be good. But you might. That's think, what they eat. They eat basically fructose yeah, or know, fructose but feeders. What gene would you give them to make them? I have no idea. Maybe one that upregulates the fructose transporter it's a tricky question uh but um it has to have an advantage to maintain this gene that's what you're saying so uh and that's a challenge do we want to put super mosquitoes out there that are you know better than them that's still not gonna lengthen their lifespan so they live a week and a half or two weeks Mm -hmm. that's the end of them no matter what whether they're super or not during those week that week and a half what if there's twice as many now because no there wouldn't no there there wouldn't be twice (laughs) as many no i don't i don't believe that but there are plenty out there already so i wouldn't worry about numbers ever okay so i don't know that that would necessarily work with tama it's an interesting idea it is interesting it's a little more uh daniel can you uh Chandran writes, Chandran. greetings TWIP fellows. I've been listening to all of Vincent's podcasts on the Weather Network for a few years now <laughs> and find them all exceptionally entertaining, interesting, and educational. What? Today, I write in for the first time from down in Australia. 
I have been much interested in the CRISPR system and all of its applications in molecular biology since I first heard about it on TWIV or TWIM, I forget which, a couple of years ago, while I was doing my undergraduate degree. Back in the present, I have literally just started my PhD last week, and the major focus happens to be on the gene drive system. I wanted to provide a comment and a question in response to TWIP number 100's discussion of the Dean Drive paper by Gans et al. One thing Vincent mentioned was that a flaw with the Gene Drive is that if the Cas gene ever gets mutated, then it disrupts the whole system as it can no longer spread. This isn't really much of an issue, however, as the allele with the mutated Cas will still only spread through the population in a Mendelian fashion. Whereas every other copy of the gene drive is in the population with a fully functional cast gene will mm. continue to spread in a super Mendelian fashion with those incredibly high inheritance rates of greater than 90%. In addition to this, that allele with mutated cast will still be carrying a functional copy of whatever kind of cargo genes you're trying to spread through the population. So it will not hinder the other copies of the gene drive with still functional casts. That's a good point. Yeah, this is it's it's perfect. That's, we so, should just give him the degree. So the previous uh, <laughs> concern, the, Witana, you don't have to worry because yeah, he's right. The uh, the regular copy is going to drive through in a super Mendelian fashion. Perfect. I was also intrigued and a bit mystified by Daniel's comments in regards to not wanting to wipe out a single species of mosquito. Earlier in the podcast, he <laughs> seemed to be making the opposite case as he pointed out how many people died per year from malaria, and that should be the priority in these kinds of decisions. Uh, keep up the podcasting regards, Chandran. So, Chandran, I'm, I'm going to just come out. This will be like my my public comment. Uh -oh. um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> is everyone sitting? Is everyone? You seat? know, I, I I would actually. So there are there are over three thousand species of mosquitoes, there right? Are. There's only a few hundred that transmit diseases to That's human correct. beings. That is correct. I would be completely happy with those few hundred species of mosquitoes being wiped off the planet. You would. I am completely happy with that. You don't think nature yeah. abhors a vacuum? You may maybe You know there's there's 3000 right? other there's 3000 other mosquitoes. If we get rid of a, a few. Vacuum. You know what? You know who will fill that vacuum? Other things less unpleasant. ISIS. <laughs> I mean, right, right. You know, we uh, this conversation came up yesterday at, at dinner with my parents, and they're like, "So the Zika virus? They're you know they're all excited about that." And they're like, "So by the way, Dan, what about malaria? Is that you know you don't hear about that in the news? That's still a problem." <laughs> I'm like, yeah, "To the tune of what two thousand people a day are, uh, are dying? Owns so the world, unfortunately. so two hundred and fifty million people every year That's get right. sick yeah, with malaria. Correct. You know, somewhere between half to a million people yeah. die every year. Yeah, I think I gave yeah. the number somewhere." Mm -hmm. About two thousand a day, um, yeah. You know what? It's still you know, hanging around. You know what? I abhor. I abhor that many people getting sick and dying, and so nature can have its vacuum. It can be upset, yeah, and I can yeah. be upset. So, <laughs> so Chandran, I will come out officially that if we could get rid of those few hundred mosquitoes that are spreading all these diseases, I'm okay. Something else will fill in. My Dixon, if you got rid of all the mosquitoes on Earth, would that all be of a, them? All of them? Would that be a problem? Oh my yes. Yeah. yeah absolutely. So There's I'm tons gonna, of organisms out there that eat them almost exclusively. So I'm going to refer all our listeners to a, a, a news article in Nature. And this, this is old. This is from uh, 2010, July 2010. And it is called <coughs> Ecology, A World Without Mosquitoes. No. And they go through and they actually, um, they, it's by Janet Fang. And she asks the question, if we got rid of all the mosquitoes on the planet, what would be the consequence for the ecosystems? That's really interesting. And so uh, why, don't, why don't people check that out? Um, yeah. it's, it's an interesting discussion, yeah. but I'm going to come away with the few hundred that cause human disease. I'm very happy getting you know, rid of them. Daniel, you don't even need to do all of those few hundred. You need to do about five. Okay. Just five Anopheles species. And you've you've done it. Anopheles gambi, Anopheles dyrus, the... Anopheles reborn eye, and no, <laughs> you can't get rid of dengue and malaria. I'm sorry, that doesn't work. Like that. <laughs> that too many too many healthy people in the world. Too what many, will happen? Well, no, <laughs> too many uh, end, endocrine disruptors for the planet. <laughs> Hey, Dixon, can you take the next one? No, I can't because I can't get this darn thing uh, to come back on my I'll, computer. I'll but I'll, I'm passing over. You can read off he's, my computer. He's passing it over. Right there. <clears throat> and the next one is written by Anne, who Actually, says... Uh, it's Carrie. Carrie, I'm Carrie sorry, writes. Carrie, it's Carrie writes. Hello, I'm very... 
I very much enjoy listening to your podcast for the first time today. I'm a veterinarian studying for a board exam of the American College of Veterinary and Preventive Medicine, which encompasses public health as well as veterinary medicine, and your podcast was recommended by a fellow candidate. Nice. I wanted to say that not only should your textbook get in the hands of all the medical students, but also all the veterinary medical students, or scientists as well. I'll read that again, but also of all veterinary medical students. So she wants them both in the medical students and the veterinary medical yeah. students. I look forward to hearing more of your podcast. Thank you, and the best regards, Carrie. So you had said last time, talking about yeah. your book, you want to get it in the hands of medical students, and she's saying vet- veterinary is a crossover. Medical students it, we as well. should cover sure, them both. right? Absolutely. And then uh, related to your book yes. is from Anne, who, who writes, "Dear Twip Team." During the discussion of potential mechanisms for the publication of the sorely needed updated parasitology text, it occurred to me that one of the potential resources not mentioned was the Gates Foundation. So much of the Gates Foundation's focus is on global health initiatives yeah. with an emphasis on the diseases of the develop, developing world. I would think this project fits well into their overall goals, even if it is not something that fits the typical research program project paradigm. And from Beaverton, Oregon, who wrote earlier, right. you need to get on the horn with Bill. And find out if he can fund your book. Excuse me. And, <laughs> but we've already visited that scene earlier in, uh, in an iteration of trying to get the book back up and running. We did submit a grant to the Gates Foundation. You did. And you they did. send it right back. You did? Yeah. Yeah, well, you didn't do a With good Chuck. writing. You didn't do a good was, writing. Yeah, let I Daniel. I was involved Let Daniel do it. No wonder it failed. <laughs> <laughs> let Daniel do it. You think I'm out of touch? You are out of touch, yeah. <laughs> you are out of touch. Let Daniel do it. What did they say? Did they give a reason? Um, they sidestepped it. They actually didn't give yeah. a reason. How many years ago was that? Uh, it was at least eight. Yeah. Okay. Understood. The last email is from Anthony, who sends a link to an interesting story published in Iran front page. <laughs> Two seven thousand year old female body found in Tehran is infected with pinworms. 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 Enterobium. Enterobium. <laughs> Enterobiasis. Enterobium, what's the whole Enterobius full name? Enterobius vermicularis. Enterobius vermicularis. And um, so how would they know it has pinworm, Dixon? Well, they look for the eggs. It has a very well-preserved body. It was found during sewage, sewage excavation works yeah. in downtown Tehran. Is now on display in a ga- glass case in the National Museum. Wow. They have a picture of it here, and it's a skeleton. So you would find the pinworm, what, eggs? Eggs. Preserved? Mostly eggs. Yeah, mostly eggs. Dixon, let me just ask you one question. Please Are we do. surprised? Nope. Not at all. No, right? not at all. Coprolites, which date back further than that, you know, like 10,000, even 20,000 years ago, you can find the remnants of Trachyrus, Ascaris, and Pinworm, and Hookworm, too. And that's a fragile egg. You can still find the outlines of the egg. Mm-hmm. So. These are old diseases. I mean, that doesn't surprise me either because, you know, human beings have been around for 200,000 years. Two, so Homo sapiens are 200,000 years old? Yeah. What is the oldest body we've ever found, do you know? Uh, well, I think we found Lucy. I think that was at the, well, on the cusp of becoming that's human. That's not Homo sapiens. No, it's just before. I want to know the oldest Homo sapiens. Oh, I think 200,000 years. Though. I think there, we have a lot of skeletons. Now let's look it up. Because you're not, do. you're not helping me. He's looking in the, <laughs> he's looking in the closet. <laughs> Homo sapiens <laughs> discovery of earliest Homo sapiens skull. When? Hang on, dude. The page is loading. <laughs> One hundred sixty thousand years old. All right. Forty thousand years earlier than the previous oldest remains. This oh. was found in Ethiopia. There you go. Wow, and it was published in Nature. They have a quite complete skeleton here. Well, that's very close to the origins of humans. Wow. Wow. Old Ivy Dixon, it looks bar. just like, <laughs> like us. Like you. me? <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow. Hello? Thank you, Anthony. That's pretty cool. Uh, but I'd like to know if 160,000 year old humans had pinworm, if we inherited yeah. them from our pre human yeah. ancestors. Probably. There are some diseases we did inherit from our uh, hominid, is that the word, hominid ancestors. You know, Dixon, here's one thing no matter how much. Hell, I give you, science is amazing. Okay. It's okay. It's science is amazing. I don't take it personal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This episode of, what is it, TWIP? TWIP. We're on TWIP now. You can find it on iTunes and at microbe.tv slash TWIP. And we love getting your questions and comments. You know, Dixon can answer all of them. TWIP. And incorrectly, I might add. TWIP, <laughs> twip at microbe.tv. 
you have to get more confidence in yourself to get through life, young man. <laughs> young Gotta man. go back to school. <laughs> young man. Twip, twip at microbe.tv. And you should give us your case guesses as well to twip at microbe.tv. Absolutely. Daniel Griffin is here at Columbia University Medical Center. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. Nice job today with the uh, case, as usual. Good deal. Dixon de Pommier yep. is here also at yeah. the Medical Center, but you can find him at trichinella.org, which would be relevant to today's right. paper, right? Right. You, you bet. You bet. Uh, thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear on TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is, is parasitic. parasitic.